Hi, this is Carl Miller, and today I'm going to discuss integrations into service virtualization using our APIs and a few of the typical use cases of those. So, APIs. Um, the first one we're going to talk about is the Lisa Invoke 2 that has uh, been around since 2013. It's our primary uh, public API. Um, documentation is available in DocOps. And um, if you're running on locally, you just go to localhost 1505 API Swagger, and you can see what it is. Primary use cases are control of servers, VSEs, simulators, coordinators. In virtual services, you could start, stop, delete, reset. You can create from a zip file. You can deploy a MAR file. Very limited control over tests. So the other one, the more recent one, is the Virtualize Invoke API 2017, latest generation of APIs. The, we've got the V1 endpoints are not public. The V2 endpoints are. Um, documentation uh, is available. We've got uh, the Virtualize Invoke Lisa-Virtualize-Invoke API V2. Use cases for this are creation of virtual services from, say, design artifacts such as WSDL and Swagger are our pairs. You can start, stop, control recordings. You can add transactions to virtual services. It's primarily data protocols, SOAP, JSON, XML, and REST. So the other thing you can do with this is you can modify existing virtual services such as uh, the recording endpoints, I mean the listening endpoints, the ports they're listening on, et cetera. So with that, we're going to go into a uh, demo. So this is the uh, this is the Invoke Two APIs. So with this, you can get the uh, virtual service environments list. Get the list of the virtual service environments. Um, this is the older one. As you can see, you can try out with these things with the swagger, etc. Um, this is the uh, Lisa dash virtualize dash invoke API v2. In this case, you can get the virtual services. Um, so if we do the get VSE. Let me try this out. They're both going against uh, this, uh, the same virtual service. You can see everything's going to come back in JSON on this one. And in this case, everything came back as XML. Important to remember on that. So in my dev test portal, I don't have any virtual services currently up and running. Push that down a little bit. And I'm going to demonstrate these using application tests. Now, I can do these with any uh, thing that can do REST, such as Postman. Uh, any, any REST agent um, will work for this. I'm just using application tests for this. So everything will start off, uh, all these are REST calls. So here's my get VSEs. Um, I've got a bunch of things configured on this in my project. And then I've got a specific one created from Swagger. So service name is going to be SV from Swagger, service port 8214. Uh, a few other things I've got uh, pushed in here um, for this demo. So if I was to execute this right now, I'm going to get a response back in JSON of what information I, there is on the VSE. And it most importantly is this VSE ID, which will be used for a lot of other things going forward. So let's go into the ITR and see how these all work together. Let's pull this over a little bit. A little bit more, get a little more space here. So okay, here we go. So I'm going to execute the first one, and I'm going to get my VSEs. So here's my JSON. 
there's a call that was executed. Here's my JSON coming back um, with the v L import VSE ID. Now I'm going to create a builder session. So this builder session is going to be the foundation for building anything. You do create one of these whenever you're going to do anything with a like creating a virtual service or modifying a virtual service. So this is used for that creation or modification of virtual service. I've got a content here. I got some uh, JSON. I've got the name I'm going to give that a virtual service. And I've got a Swagger service using Invoke2. It's just a, a description. So there's my URL. Here's my path, Lisa dash virtualize invoke v2, obviously VSCs, and create a uh, builder session uh, using a post. We'll go back to our ITR now. So most, a lot of these calls, uh, like transaction bundle, et cetera, will have some uh, JSON content that you will be sending. So we're going to execute this and get a builder session. Uh, create a transaction bundle. This is one that really doesn't have uh, any uh, real content. Uh, neither does an input container. Um, some do, some don't. Depends on what you're going to need them for. So uh, transaction bundle. I've created an input container. This is going to allow me to load files up in there, such as Swagger, RR pairs, et cetera, WSDL, if uh, we were working with SOAP. So I'm going to use the MIME type to load a Swagger file. And I've got a data set here. Um, that's one of the real advantages of the API. So I'm uploading the data into the input container. In this case, this is a uh, get call get accounts with an account ID uh, from the Swagger, execute another one, and I'm going to upload another Swagger file. This is something that uh, uh, you can't do in the portal and you can't easily do in the workstation. So the APIs do give you some um, good ability here. I could actually load RR pairs into this if I wanted to for specific things such as a happy path, a negative test, and an error case. So the APIs do give you a lot of uh, things that you don't normally, you d can't do easily um, through the UI. Okay, let's go to here. Now I'm going to create a transport protocol. This is going to say um, what my uh, what I'm listening on. So if we look at the content here, I've got a type ID of HTTP. I'm going to tell it what host I'm going to be on and what port, service port, which is defined in my config file as 8214. So I can also set the target endpoint. So if I want to change what my live invocation server and port are, I could change these. I can uh, set these in this also. Just I just have them hard coded in here for the time being. Go back to my ITR. And I'm going to execute this. So I've created my transport protocol, and as you can see, 8214 is going to be my recording endpoint. That would also be the port the virtual service would uh, uh, work on. So I'm going to process the data using the input processor. If I was working with a lot of files, I would want to check the status before I continued on. In this case, we can see it's completed. Nothing was skipped, no errors. So we'll keep going. I'm going to do a little cleanup here. Just uh, clean up some memory. It will eventually recycle this, but I like to do it uh, when I'm working. As I've said, these controls, these calls are very granular, which allow you a tremendous amount of power to uh, modify these. And with the configurations, uh, you can do, you can automate this very, very easily. So at this point, I'm going to issue a command to get any data protocols. There are none, of course, because I haven't set them. I'm going to now add data protocols. And this is very important for when you're uh, working with uh, certain data protocols. The REST data protocol especially, I'm giving it some content in here. I'm telling it 
it's four requests true, that's normal. Type ID, my data protocol, in this case it would be the REST DPH. If we look in my project file, I've got REST DPH as my primary and my secondary is JSON DPH. Um, when you've got REST, these are important. I'm going to tell it I've got a blank array of rules and user configures is false. That tells the system to go ahead, look at what's being put in, and figure out what the rules are. So really important there. And if on JSON, it's just type ID and data protocol too, which will be JSON DPH. So we'll go back to RTR. And we'll run these. Here's my rest, URL param. There's my JSON added to. I can view my transactions if I want, um, see what they look like. This really doesn't give you a lot of information, so I usually don't skip it. But these are possible, so you can see that you do have transactions in there. At this point, we're going to create a bundle processor, which is going to take the transactions the we've added into the builder session, and it's going to apply the data protocols. So it's in process. I'm going to check the status of it. Of course, if I had a lot of files, it's finished. I've got two transactions in there. I've got it, which is what I expect, because I've got to get in post. So I'm going to view these without any data protocols. And what that basically means is without any protocols, it's not going to see any arguments here. So when I do view them with my data protocols, um, we'll now see that we do have arguments here, credit score, reason, amount, account, ID decision, we do have these arguments here that it's recognized from the structure of the Swagger. At this point, I'm going to create a virtual service MAR file. This is a call to actually tell the builder session to create a virtual service, and I've got a accept content application zip um, or uh, so that I'm going to pull down a zip file, and as you notice, I'm going to pull it down into one of these here. So when I execute this, it's going to pull down my MAR file. If I go over and refresh this, I now have a MAR file uh, that I can use downloaded to wherever I want it to. And it's gone to this one here. So at this point, I'm going to take that MAR file. I'll scroll down here so you can see where I am. I've created my virtual service MAR. I'm going to load it, and I'm going to deploy it. So there I've loaded it, and now I'm going to deploy this to my virtual service environment. And if we go here, we now have this up and running. You can still see we have a recording there, but my virtual service is up and running on 8214. If I execute this to do cleanup, delete my bundle processor, and delete my builder session, at that point, and when we refresh this, there we go, we won't see that recording anymore. That's really what that is, is that builder session there. But at this point, I've created a virtual service just from a Swagger. Um, just from a Swagger file, and I've got that up. There are other commands you can use. I can actually get the list of services that are running on my virtual service environment. I've only got one, SV from Swagger. I can get the last service added. I can get that service ID. I can get the specifics on this service. So with this, you can actually take a service that's running and get all the information you want, what data protocols it's being used, what are the transactions in here. You could actually iterate through this um, and get the request information and the response information. And if you wanted, 
build RR pairs. The only thing you have to remember on this is the body is in base 64, so you just have to run a base 64 decode to get what the information is in the responses or in the body if it was a post. So now I'm going to run into some normal ones that you're going to see, and these are going to use that other uh, the least invoke two. I've primarily been doing the least of virtualize invoke, and this is going to be the invoke two one. So at this point, I'm going to let's go back so you can see in the portal what we got going. So I've got that one up and running. I'm going to stop that virtual service. Go, and it's refreshed. It's now offline. I'm going to start it. Okay, and this should refresh in a second or two. Go ahead and push it. So it's refreshing and it's starting. So what you can do with this is these calls, you could have virtual services up and running, but start and stop them as needed, as you need them for different tests or different scenarios that you want. I can also now delete this virtual service so I could deploy, run it, and delete it if I needed to. So I could use this in a lot of different situations for uh, continuous delivery, continuous testing. There it is, it's gone. So now if I wanted to, I'm going to load this MAR from this file here, but I could also do this from a source control management repository. So I can execute, I could pull it from a source control management, and then I can just load it to create a builder session. So I'm going to do that. So there we go. I've created a builder session. It's going to um, give me the ID of the builder session that I'll need for that. So there's the ID that I need. Now I did this as a curl command. This curl command just to show you that you can use anything you want to do this. This is just a regular curl command. You could execute this from a command line if uh, you want it scripted, et cetera. So we'll go back to the ITR. But in this case, I've got a MAR file, but the MAR file has it on port 8214, and I don't want it. I'm going to load it into, if I had to load it into a different environment, and I had a different port, um, say service port 2, I need it on 8225. So I've loaded my MAR file into my builder session. I'm going to execute the command to get my transport protocol from the MAR. So there it has my port 8224. I'm now going to execute a update command. This is a put call, and I'm going to give it service port 2 to uh, from there. So I'm going to change the port it's running on. It's, it's going to be listening on. This is great because this allows you to have one MAR file but change the environment it has. I could also change the target endpoint, which would be the live server and the host at this time too. So if you need these for different environments, you could do this. At this point, I'm going to create a updated virtual service MAR. And I've downloaded this with a slightly different name over here. And then I'm going to load it, and I'm going to deploy it. So now I have it up and running on port 8225 as I need. So as you can see, these virtual service APIs are extremely powerful, allow you to do anything, uh, almost anything you need with virtual services, and they even offer some things that the interfaces don't, such as the ability to load multiple Swaggers uh, files um, at one time. So have a good time with the uh, virtual service APIs, and thank you very much.